know that this subject, when it first came out and it started really taking root, there was some hesitation towards what is this? Is this another veiled um, regulatory action? Is that being driven by retailers? Is it being driven by big corporation in order to move more product through the through the checkout line? And it really isn't scary that way. It really is probably a combination of the consumer wanting to be aware of corporations and businesses at the other end of the supply chain responding to the consumer and we need to not be afraid to respond to the consumer as well because we have such great stories to tell on every one of our individual operations. Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversation podcast where we talk about all things related to ranching by connecting you to peer ranchers and industry leaders to improve the profitability of your operation and your lifestyle. Now, if you are looking for a community of ranchers, sign up for my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are mastermind events for ranchers. You join a Zoom link and you sit down and have a conversation with other ranchers and industry leaders about specific topics that help you improve your operation and face the challenges that we face as an industry as a whole. Now, if you want immediate ranch management advice, go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com slash newsletter and sign up. When you sign up, I will send you a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the ranching gurus who have been on my show and poured out their knowledge for all to hear. With that, be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram by following Cattle Convos. You can connect with me there, or you can go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com to find anything you may need. I'm excited to meet you, and let's get on with the show. Hey folks, if you are interested in finding a way to increase the profitability of your calves and hit that profit goal you have set, take a listen to this message from our friends at the Red Angus Association. As input costs soar, beef producers are eyeing value-added programs to help reach their profitability goals. The Red Angus Feeder Calf Certification Program, the most mature value-added program in the beef industry, is expanding and helping more producers earn premiums on their calves. The FCCP combines three important components into a single value-added program, genetics, source, and age verification. Cattle producers recognize the value of the yellow FCCP tag and continue to see market-topping premiums for a minimal investment by enrolling their Red Angus sired calves. And for those producers who seek age and source verification but are lacking the Red Angus sired component, be sure to check out the Allied Access Program, which is eligible to age and source verify every calf born in the United States, regardless of breed. For more information on Red Angus value-added programs and the FCCP, please go to redangus.org and start opening new doors to marketing avenues and maximizing your return on investment. All right, Steve, good morning, and thank you for joining me on the show today. I know you've been on my list of people to interview for quite some time, so I appreciate you taking the time out of your morning to uh, come visit with me and share your insight on sustainability and ranching with my audience. Thank you, Shay. It's a pleasure to be here. So to kind of just get right into it, we are talking about sustainability today, but to start off, can you give the listeners a background on where you're located and what your operation looks like today? Sure. Um, we're located in Southeast Colorado, Shay, uh, Los Animas County, which is uh, right on the border of Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, we are unique in the plains of Eastern Colorado that there's this huge canyon structure that starts at the Continental Divide and flows out into the plains. And we're we're in that canyon structure. So we have elevations from 5,600 foot to 4,400 foot. And all the challenges that come with that type of structure of deep canyons, heavy sloping hillsides, and then mesas or plateaus in between canyons. We're, uh, 
fourth generation family. Joey and I are the fourth generation. We're blessed to have fifth and sixth generation in our daughter and son-in-law and three grandchildren on the ranch with us. Our older daughter is in Southeast New Mexico on her husband's Centennial Ranch. And they also are fourth generation ranching down there. Uh, we are a cow-calf operation, Red Angus based. Um, began in the early 1900s as a Hereford operation and that carried forward well into the 60s before we started crossbreeding and ultimately settled with the Red Angus breed for all of its advancement and forward thinking processes that we felt like were appropriate for our, our operation. Uh, we've had to diversify like so many other operations have. So we have a hunting operation. We have a landscape stone operation that we, we sell that product and we do a small amount of vacations. So we have guests come for wildlife watching, for ranching, for one of the newest ones we've added is we have artists come and they teach while they're on the ranch. So we use the landscape as sort of a marketing tool. So what stemmed you to start diversifying and adding other ventures outside of just cattle production? What initiated that? It was, it was finances, Shay, totally finances. We saw that my mom and my uncle's generation was probably the last generation that could have multiple families on the ranch and the cattle would pay all the bills. And so in 1989, we started a hunting enterprise and that evolved for a while and it worked for us for a while and and then came the landscape stone sales and and that we're 60 miles from the nearest town so an off the farm or off the ranch job was really difficult and joy tried it she's she's a agronomist botanist she loves to grow things and she and her sister and, and niece, they bought a greenhouse and they started growing potted plants and delivering potted plants in the spring. But we soon found out that the transit back and forth and the fact that she was missing out on being on the ranch, being with her grandkids, uh, we, we said quality of life is as important as, as finances. We'll find a way to make it work. And so they sold that business and, and came back to the ranch. Uh, it's still a challenge and it's something that we teach our younger generation. When our daughters went to college, we said agriculture is moving so fast. And with the advent of quality internet, information is going to flow so fast that our advice to you is do not take agriculture in college unless you want to go into a subsidiary branch rather than production. So our younger daughter took agriculture marketing and our older daughter took uh, history and coaching, realizing that in small communities, the school needs a ready source of, of teachers. And most teachers that have multiple assets are going to be uh, chosen as, as teachers. Um, so we have we've utilized Aaron's marketing degree to do analysis of businesses on the ranch and, and additional possible income sources that are on the ranch. And today, Nikki is coaching down at the high school that where she lives in southeast New Mexico. Well, that is outstanding. And thank you for sharing that and being honest about you know, what that stemmed from and you know how you've guided generations younger than you to go about how they can get involved in agriculture. So shifting back to sustainability, which in a sense that is part of sustainability is keeping your ranch sustainable from a workload source and financial source, but maybe on the environmental side, what, how do you define sustainability? Well, and, and like we've talked and I've, I've heard you say before, it you'll get a different answer from every producer out there, 700,000 beef producers, and you'll get a different answer what sustainability means. And I think we're struggling with what sustainability means in the entire beef supply chain. And, and to that degree, that's why we stood up the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef is to try to have common language from producer to plate if we can. But from my perspective, sustainability is telling the story of what multiple generations have been doing on the, on the ground that involves the land, 
the vegetation, the water, the, the, the air, and the wildlife, as well as the livestock that we care for and we raise on a daily basis. And so that is, that is my definition of sustainability. And it's a story that we've tried to tell and people like you that are out there trying to, trying to put it out in social media are trying to tell that story. But for the first time in, in all of our lives, the consumer, whether it's led by the retailer with, with advertising or if the consumer truly is curious about where food comes from. And I think we saw that during the pandemic that the consumer really took a look at where food comes from and had the opportunity by shortages in grocery stores to reach out and know your farmer, know your rancher. And through that, they asked a lot of questions. And we found that the consumer trusts a lot, but has very little working knowledge of what it takes to get a crop in off the, off the field and into the grocery store or raise a beef from birth to processing and then to a, a quality steak on their center of their plate. Um, so that being what we define as sustainability is the social side, which is the human side, and then the planet side, which is all those factors I talk about that ranchers have been taking care of, but then the profit side. And that's what you were saying is, is the finance is also a form of sustainability, because if we don't address that one, we can do all the great work we can with ecosystems and with telling our story on social media. If we can't be profitable, we're off, off the ranch. Thank you for going through that explanation. So why should sustainability be at the forefront of the rancher's mind? Like I was saying, it, it's, it's a conversation that has come and it's time has come. And each one of us has achieved a level of success in, oper in managing and operating our unique ranches and farms. And throughout the U.S., we, we have every type of geographic structure there is in the Northeast and the, in the Southeast with, with Everglades and here on the desert plains where we're at. And, and then high up in the mountains in Colorado where we've got ranchers running at 8,000 to 10,000 foot elevation. <clears throat> we're managing so many different diverse ecosystems and yet producing beef off of every one of those ecosystems. And it's just the coolest story to share out and let the consumer know that you don't have to worry about what beef is, is taking away from your human consumption because cows have this incredible ability to consume non-human -ed non edible product, convert it into milk and convert it into a calf that becomes beef. We do, we do it on a daily basis. We've been doing it for generations. So think about how you can tell your story, have a, have an opportunity in a, they call it a, a elevator speech. Can you in 30 seconds, tell somebody how animal welfare is important to your operation and really caring for the animals. And can you tell them how the cows are out there in their natural environment they're, they're as happy as you can make a cow happy by just letting her graze freely. So that those are the things that you think about in terms of the outside sustainability, getting that message out that probably hasn't ever been told before, but the consumer is anxious and wants to hear more about it. I like your approach on the elevator speech of side of that, because I've been told, you know, have your elevator pitch for your business, which I do for this business, but sometimes we discredit ourselves as farmers and ranchers in what our elevator speech is there. So thank you for bringing that to light. So can you talk about how your family has worked to make your operation sustainable? You've talked about how you've made it sustainable or to fit your definition of sustainability on the financial side, but what about, what have some of those changes been through generations as far as the environment, wildlife, um, animal welfare side that you've worked through? We, I'll, I'll back up to my senior year at Colorado State University and in my range management class, we had a guest speaker, a gentleman from Africa that had moved back to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and that was Alan Savory. And he spoke about a different system for putting cattle out on range and moving cattle and, and 
paying attention to what's happening out there. And I, I guess the key point to Alan's philosophy was, was you pay more attention to the rest period than the grazing period. And so Joy and I come home from college in December of 1979. And I tell my uncle, I heard this guy speak and it's really unique what he's advocating in terms of improving the total amount of, of available forage, but also the health and, and condition of the forage. And he said, yep, we have a five day course from uh, the Center for Holistic Resource Management and Alan will be teaching that course this spring. And so that was the next step in our lifelong continuous learning process where I tried to get ahead of him and found out that most of the time he's ahead of me, but that, that was also feedback. So the, the continuous learning and the philosophy of care for the land, care for the resources was multi-generational back to us. And as we began that journey of studying how we can have more available forage, be more resilient to drought, we ended up going to, um, Dave Pratt with the Ranching for Profit program and ultimately Dallas Mount. And then I have several individuals that I follow and Bert Teichert is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and from Burke's philosophy of a least cost operation, we made some significant changes as we went into a rotational grazing program. We decided it it's time to cut the overhead costs. That was the next step in the financial, but it was also a resource side. We believed that we could develop a cow that's capable of going out on forage with just minimal protein, mineral, and vitamin supplement and raise a calf every year, be highly efficient in terms of 97% cows bred every year. So we kind of took that philosophy and it was something that we'd heard from others too, that you've got to get your operation to be a least cost operation. And so with the, with the improved grazing management, the longer rest periods, and then cutting unnecessary overhead costs, we kind of made that holistic change in our overall operation. We've seen an increase in, in, and I get teased all the time because I've always go into a cow dung or a, or a dried turd and I'm turning it over to see if we've got insects because I'm excited if we've got insects, that means we've got a functioning soil ecosystem there. Um, I have pictures on my phone of, of beetles going through a, a fresh manure pile and, and it just is the way that we monitor everything to see what the conditions are out there. So that's really neat. And Burke Teichert and Dallas Mount have actually both been on the show before too. So it's neat to hear them talk about it, but then hear you talk about how that's influenced your op replacement females for your herd. Check out this message. The cow. No wonder they call her the foundation female. On her shoulders rests the genetic basis of any cow herd. So it's critical she measures up to your expectations for stability and fertility. How can you create more high quality females while eliminating the guesswork and upfront costs that accompany heifer development? The Red Angus Association of America offers progressive producers the opportunity to enroll in Red Choice, a program designed to aid in developing the highest quality heifers through genomic testing, AI technology, and and veterinarian partnerships. Heifers that meet the criteria are more likely to stay in the herd, propagate the best genetics, and make a positive impact on your bottom line, which is increasingly more important as input prices soar. Learn more about Red Choice and capitalizing on your female's genetic potential at redangus.org. So as you went through and started making those changes, what were some of the challenges you faced as you started transitioning into the least cost operation and some of those holistic management practices? To give a background of, of what we were before we made that change, um, we would use a cake hopper like, like so many ranches in the West have. And every other day we hauled cake out to cows. And that trip was a 15 to 20 mile trip to go feed those cows supplemental cake every other day. So we were firing up a pickup, burning diesel or gasoline, putting rubber on the road. Um, we would typically lay in 70 ton of pelleted feed and 300 ton of hay. 
And if we got six inches of, of snow on the ground, we fed hay. And we, we kind of, through those mentors, we kind of came to the realization that we're really running a welfare program. And so when we made the change to cut that back, today we have 24 ton of, of pelleted feed. Um, that's strictly for yearling heifers and first calf heifers. The cow herd gets a, a 200 pound tub of vitamin, mineral, and protein, and it's placed out in the pastures and the cows don't see the truck. If we put two weeks worth of product out there, they don't see the truck for two weeks. We only put in a hundred ton of, of hay now, and that is for the young cattle, and then only 10 days of, of snow feed. What happened when we started that, and we asked those cows to adjust, is there was some fallout in performance. We found out which of those cows were being overly supplemented by our program instead of expressing their full genetic potential. And so for about five years, we were doing some pretty heavy culling, but at the same time as we were culling out those individuals that couldn't maintain body condition, couldn't get bred, we also were bringing in our best genetics because we were replacing them with young heifers that were new to the program and had already been in the program. And so we were actually seeing faster genetic turnover in our herd towards what should be those better genetic heifers coming in from sire selection. And once that was, once that went through, we started to see those key performance indicators come back. Percentage cows bred in the fall, calves delivered to calving at, at and branding and then wean calves delivered. We got those numbers back, but it, it took about a five year period while we made that adjustment and we saw a little bit of weaning weight loss. We definitely saw condition problems with the cows trying to stay in a five. We'd like them to be in a five, five minus. Um, but even at that, we can pick them up from a four plus and, and get them back to breeding if they've had a hard winter. Thank you for sharing that and talking about those initial challenges, but also, you know, expressing how you had that higher genetic turnover, which I think is important to remember. So what questions should ranchers be asking themselves if they want to dive into their operations and see how they can make them more sustainable? Um, we had the opportunity to work with the folks at Colorado State University in what they call their track program. And I know other universities have done it. It originated um, down at uh, King Ranch Institute. And those individuals came in and we did a deep dive into the overall business structure, including the enterprises, and started pulling out instead of everything running into one enterprise as it appeared, we started taking a look at the profitability of the landscape stone sales, at the profitability of the hunting operation, and et cetera. Broke them out and did a full deep analysis of where the ranch sat. And on the financial side, we found that to be a really valuable tool when an individual, an advisor comes in and they take a different look at your operation than you do. And I think it can be your accountant but we found it very valuable working with Colorado State University to do it as well as the, the couple of meetings a year we have with our accountant. Um, the other side of it is, is we all want to continue to get better. And so look at the look at the tools that are available to you to figure out how can you increase the health of your overall grazing operation, the combination of your farming and your grazing operation. How can you continue to do better there? And sometimes those betters take a while to get to because they require a financial investment to get there, like fencing. Um, but technology is changing for us and it's changing rapidly. We're looking at working with the folks from Vince to use uh, a virtual fence on an operation. We have a leased operation that's 50,000 acres and pastures that are six to 7,000 acres big and at almost $20,000 a mile to build fence a virtual fence that's functional will let us shrink the size of those pastures and then move those virtual fences as we need to, to move the cow herd. The other thing that I think is, is coming is genomics. And we've started a, a full genomic profile of all of our females coming into our herd. And so in a period of five years, we'll have a really good 
genetic profile of what our operation looks like. We think we know where we're at with weaning weights and yearling weights and, and feedlot performance and maintenance of energy in the cow herd and, and things like that. But we're guessing we're, we're using and trying to average our EPDs and things like that as, as Brady does the bull selection. And so giving us a profile of where we are should give Brady and Aaron a better tool set so that when we're selecting sires, we're selecting sires that moves our genetic performance forward. The other side of that is we think it's a marketing tool that if we can show buyers what the average genomic performance of our group of steer, steers is or what our replacement quality heifers genomics look like, that's an added value to those animals, to the folks that are going to buy them and use them after us. I really appreciate you talking about that and about It'll probably be like six episodes before this. It's already released, but we did just talk about genomic testing and the value of that. And so I appreciate you speaking to that. And the virtual fencing is also really interesting. I'll be excited to see where that goes. But as we kind of wrap up today, Steve, you've talked about, you know, what sustainable ranches can look like as far as financially, um, environmentally management, and really covered all the bases there. You've given great examples about how your families made those transitions and even talked about what you're excited about for the future as far as technology. So what would your last advice or final remarks be to those listening to this episode? I know that this subject, when it first came out and it started really taking root, there was some hesitation towards what is this? Is this another? I know that this subject, when it first came out and it started really taking root, there was some hesitation towards what is this? Is this another veiled um, regulatory action? Is that being driven by retailers? Is it being driven by big corporation? in order to move more product through the, through the checkout line. And it really isn't scary that way. It really is probably a combination of the consumer wanting to be aware of corporations and businesses at the other end of the supply chain responding to the consumer. And we need to not be afraid to respond to the consumer as well, because we have such great stories to tell on every one of our individual operations, reinvent the wheel back home. And it, it's, it would be so cool for all of us to share those unique features that we've crafted into our operations that make us profitable, make us family sustainable, multi-generational, but it also helps our friends and neighbors when we share those stories out. Well, Steve, thank you very much for sharing your story and being on the show today. Thank you, Shay. It's been a pleasure. Hey, folks, if you are interested in finding a way to increase the profitability of your calves and hit that profit goal you have set, take a listen to this message from our friends at the Red Angus Association. As input costs soar, beef producers are eyeing value-added programs to help reach their profitability goals. The Red Angus Feeder Calf Certification Program, the most mature value-added program in the beef industry, is expanding and helping more producers earn premiums on their calves. The FCCP combines three important components into a single value-added program, genetics, source, and age verification. Cattle producers recognize the value of the yellow FCCP tag and continue to see market-topping premiums for a minimal investment by enrolling their Red Angus sired calves. And for those producers who seek age and source verification but are lacking the Red Angus sired component, be be sure to check out the Allied Access Program, which is eligible to age and source verify every calf born in the United States, regardless of breed. For more information on Red Angus value-added programs and the FCCP, please go to redangus.org and start opening new doors to marketing avenues and maximizing your return on investment. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. 
Have a great day.